Welcome everyone to this installment of the Hope, Healing and Recovery Exchange. These are virtual panel sessions for Hamilton Health and Community Care Workers. So wherever you are, uh, welcome today. Thank you sincerely for your ongoing service. Today's topic is Courageous Conversations, Communicating in Challenging Times. This is part one of two. Uh, we'll have another uh, event in April, on April 25th. Um, and so again, welcome everyone from uh, wherever you're working uh, in all these different health uh, and community sectors uh, to this uh, event. I will uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Dr. Joe Palazzari. I'm a clinical psychologist at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. I'm coming to you today from my office uh, at the Charlton campus at St. Joe's. And I have been involved uh, in a number of staff support initiatives here at the hospital. And I've participated in, in all of these uh, events uh, so far. Please know that all our prior events are uh, recorded and available on YouTube. And um, Shilpi, I don't, am I advancing the slides? Or, or, oh, they're very good. Hey, there's my photo. Um, and uh, I'm co-facilitating today with Bahar Karimi. Bahar was one of our panelists in one of our previous Hope Healing and Recovery Exchange events. And uh, she described so well uh, her experiences in working in the long-term care sector during the pandemic. And uh, we really uh, welcome her back now as a co-facilitator of today's event. Hi, Bahar. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I am uh, a registered nurse. I'm also the executive director of long-term care services with Thrive Group, uh, which includes Idlewild Manor and St. Peter's Residence at Chidok. Uh, I am also the chair of uh, Center of Excellence at Thrive Group. And one of the areas that we work on is developing a comprehensive wellness program. Um, and uh, I am also a PhD student in nursing at University of Western Ontario. I'm very happy to be here today. Welcome to all of you. Thanks, Bahar. We'll start today's event as we typically do with our land acknowledgement. This is the land acknowledgement from, from uh, my employer at St. Joe's Hamilton. So we at St. Joe's Hamilton and of course across our collaborative network of partners recognize that the lands on which we provide care are the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee peoples. For thousands of years, the first people sought to steward the precious resources and share this land with others. These territories are the subject of the dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant, an agreement between nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. At St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton and across our collaborative network of agencies, we pledge to continue to walk together with indigenous peoples in building a more just society where their gifts and those of all people are nurtured and honored. And so just to, to remind you, if you're new to these events, just uh, some housekeeping uh, issues here. Um, know that uh, all participants are muted, um, that the event is recorded and will be available on YouTube at a future time. Um, and what we're going to do is use the chat box um, during the Q&A portion of the event, which will be at the end. Um, we're going to plan uh, to, to be together for about 45 minutes or so today. So uh, around the 30 minute or so point, we're going to flip it over to the Q&A and, uh, and we'll facilitate some discussion. And also know that a list of resources uh, will, be, will be available along with a link to an evaluation survey that will be shared by email after today's session. Thank you, Joe. For those of you who might be attending our, our series for the first time, we thought it's important to review the goals together. Uh, the goals of the Hope Healing and Recovery Exchange series are to honor the diverse experiences of health and community care workers in our community, and promote collective reflection and mutual support, 
hear personal stories of overcoming challenges and reflection from others and increase awareness and available resources. We continue to work to ensure that these goals of the sessions that we have set for ourselves are realized and your feedback and suggestions are so important for us. Uh, so please share them through our session evaluations um, so they can help us with the future sessions. I would also like to acknowledge the many partners who have contributed to this work, including our presenters today. Without these partners who have envisioned the vision of these sessions with us, who are passionate about hope, healing, and recovery, and understand the importance of these sessions for health and community care workers, we thank you all. And now I feel very privileged to introduce our first speaker to you. Scott Page is a registered psychotherapist working in private practice and with Hamilton Family Health Team. He is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral neuroscience at McMaster University. Scott has also worked with Hamilton Health Sciences, St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, and Wesley here in Hamilton in therapist, spiritual care provider, and director roles. Scott, welcome, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you so much for that uh, warm welcome. Um, you can go ahead and advance the slide there, Shelby. Uh, so basically what I'm, I'm interested in uh, providing uh, today is, is a concrete tool that hopefully helps you initiate um, a critical conversation or a moment of conflict in a thoughtful and, and intentional kind of way. Uh, so next slide there. So my three objectives would be to first give you a format. These things generally go better if you're going to start uh, a moment of conflict, if you kind of have a roadmap. Uh, I want to orient some potential obstacles. Um, we all probably know conflict is hard, and, and the more we can be aware of the ways that that can be difficult, but usually the better it goes. And generally, I want to keep it practical. We could talk high level about the value of conflict or, you know, different ways that conflicts exist. but I really give you a concrete tool so you can walk away from this time with something to do. Uh, no conflicts of interest to report, so uh, we can just uh, jump right in then. <clears throat> okay, so the story that I want to ground this in is a moment of conflict in my own life. This would have been um, a few years back. I, uh, I was living uh, downtown Hamilton at the time in a semi-detached house, and I come uh, driving down the driveway after... Um, and going grocery shopping with my kids and I look across the into the neighbor's backyard and he's out there with the chainsaw cutting down a lot of cedars that would that was separating our two yards they were on his side of the property line but I was like kind of bummed because I kind of like them being there and so I went over and I talked to him I said hey what you know what, uh, what's going on here today he's like oh I'm, I'm chopping down these trees because I'm going to dig uh, an in-ground pool right here and he points a few feet away from my house he says I'm going to make a deck that spreads from one fence line to the other and uh, at that moment, like I feel this big like lump in my throat and my stomach turns and I'm like, oh, oh no. And fortunately my kids are loud enough where they uh, pulled my attention away and I got to go put the groceries away inside and have a think about um, how I'm gonna follow up on this conflict and these kind of ugh, feelings that I was having at that moment, um, thinking about what my, my neighbor was doing. So we can jump into the next slide there. Okay, so dear man, uh, Dear Man is a tool that comes from a school of therapy called um, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. Marsha Linehan was the one who initially uh, made this. There's a reference in the additional materials uh, area for where you can read more about uh, her work. I think this is a great tool for initiating conflict um, because it kind of keeps things structured and tight. Again, everything in conflict seems to want to just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's more parts, and this keeps it uh, relatively contained. Um, so it breaks down into two parts. Um, we'll walk through it here and then I'll talk about some of the obstacles and then we'll root it back into how I used it in that instance. But um, in terms of Dear Man itself, it's two components. What do you say? How do you say it? <clears throat> so what do you say? You're going to walk through these four parts. The first part is describe. Here you're going to put out the facts of the situation in sort of an indisputable way. Uh, by analogy to the law, this would be like the discovery phase. These would only be things that you and the other person would agree are true, right? So I wouldn't say to my neighbor, when I saw you doing that terrible thing, I'd say when I saw you chopping down those trees in the backyard. 
express is where I own my own interpretation of that. What am I thinking and feeling about that? I statements here, uh, I felt angry, I felt afraid, I felt worried. And then the thoughts that made me think that X, Y, Z was gonna happen. Or I was worried that this instance was gonna occur. With the express, you wanna be conscious of power differential. If you're in an authority position speaking to someone who's a subordinate or in another uh, situation where the power balance is, is not equal, you wanna be cautious around exerting too much around your own feeling and thought, but rather, or feelings, but rather keep it a little more contained in the express section. If the power differential is a little bit more equal, there's there can be less of that uh, restraint, but it's, it's um, you wanna kind of phrase your expression relative to the audience. The next step would be to assert. You'd want to come up with a clear ask. Um, so many times the ask that we have is that the other person just agree with us 100%, and that's just not going to happen. Uh, the, the assert or the, the thing you need to ask needs to be a concrete set of actions that is within the other person's power. I wouldn't ask someone to be a better person. I would ask them to do something specifically to respond to my concern that I expressed. And then the last step of the what you're going to say is reinforcing. Why is the thing that I'm asking for going to be helpful for both me and the other person in the conflict? I, um, it's always easy to remember how it's important to me, but it, the selling it to them in terms of, hey, this is what's going to help. It helps turn it from a, me and the other person facing each other to both of us facing a problem together um, and, and that there's outcomes that are beneficial for both of us. The how to say it, um, a really important a concept in dialectical behavioral therapy is mindfulness. This is a very popular word that in some ways has a diluted meaning at this point, I think in terms of our broader usage of it. In this instance, it means being non-judgmentally aware of thoughts, feelings, and sensations as they happen in the moment. Um, so this could look like being aware of, hey, I get sweaty when I start saying things that are uncomfortable. I get flushed here. I feel hot in my throat. All those things are okay and not judging them, but noticing them and telling and letting my body tell me, hey, what's going on here? Similarly, the, the words or the thoughts that I'm hearing are, are to be held kind of lightly. Part of this looks like a, a broken record technique, which would look like if I have an intention for the way I want this conversation to go or thoughts that are going on, I wanna keep that in my mind and, and return to it. So oftentimes in a conflict, you know, you'll hear the, well, you always, or well, this reminds me of the other time, or, you know, that's those are okay when you hear that and you're getting pulled away from the core content that you're after you can broken record back so remember if you can go back to d-e-a-r where are you in that template and go back and repeat it it's fine to go back and repeat because that puts you right back mindfully in the same moment the next bit of how you want to go about saying a conflict is appearing confident um my best models of this are um, teachers i think about middle school teachers of mine who stood in the middle of the classroom of like 30 kids all just you know flying off the handle in uh you know end of the school year and and what are they doing you know the the really um, confident teachers i think talk slow they take the long pause they stand in the middle of the room and they kind of draw the classes energy to them rather than trying to raise up in a conflict you want to do the same thing slow down. And if you're not finding your words, that's even a better reason to slow down. It demands that your, your, your point is valid and you don't have to get bigger to prove it. The last how you want to do it is, is a bit of a postural thing. You want to be willing to negotiate. Now, that doesn't mean that you start by giving alternatives to what your ask is, but you, you want to have this open, like, give to get sort of positioning, right? Be willing to hear an alternative. And, and finally, if you're in a conflict and you're not you know, it's just no, 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 I can't, I won't. To say, okay, well, how do we get to this same reinforcer? You know, we, we want this outcome. What would be another option that we could get there? That's sort of the how you say it. So a couple things to highlight in terms of um, ways to start these conflicts better, if you can go to the next slide there. So um, using this tool. So first one is lower your expectations. Conflict and, and a critical conversation are stressful. So don't expect that there's gonna be a resolution quickly. You know, this is not, I've never been in a conflict that looks like a few good men when like Tom Cruise gets Jack Nicholson on the stand and gets him to just be like, all right, like you can't handle the truth. I've never had one of those. I don't know if anyone else has. They seem like they're pretty rare. The resolution usually looks like two people walking away 
kind of angry and a little upset that the whole thing just had to go down that way. The resolution that you're looking for is, does, is your ask doable? Do you reach some kind of concrete action that you can get to that's going to move towards a reinforcing result? And lower your expectation for calm. Again, if you're sweaty, if your voice trembles, if you feel like you just want to run away from the instance or you just want to like punch somebody, those feelings are valid and that's acceptable and that's really normal. Human beings, I think we're not exactly... Uh, conflicts can be dangerous. So to be afraid, to be upset, and that makes all kinds of sense. Lower your expectations that you're going to be anything but that. The other um, way to, to initiate conflict a little better is to prepare in advance. Part of why I really like Dear Man is you can write out your dear statement in advance. Bullet points on a piece of paper ahead of time. You know, it really helps build the script of what you're after ahead of time so that when you hear that, you always, or, you know, you people never seem to care. But like, you can kind of be like, yeah, okay, I get it. Where am I going again? And you kind of have that roadmap burned a little deeper in. The other one would be to rehearse it. This could be, you know, in the mirror, or it could be with someone else who's kind of unrelated to the conflict, but who cares about you, who can say like, yeah, okay, here's some feedback. But the running it through in advance really gets you in that place where you know how to, how to engage with that conflict. Okay, so the next slide there. So using um, this, anal this, this uh, instance of conflict in my own life, um, I'll run through my my uh, my own version of the dear man thing so describing when i looked over the fence line and i saw you chopping down those cedars and you said you were going to be putting an in-ground pool here express i felt worried and, and a little afraid because i was thinking about what that's going to do to the foundation of my own house and and what that's going to look like for the safety of my kids if um you know if they would get into that area assert I'd like you to look into what the zoning is for our neighborhood, pull any necessary permits, and, and please let me know what the conclusion to that is, what you find out when you do that kind of looking into this. Reinforce. That way you can go ahead with putting um, what would make your backyard enjoyable to you in, and I can um, not be worried about safety or the, or the security or resale value of my own house. So that's the deer, as I would spell it out. Didn't come out that smooth because I was, again, nervous because it's a conflict. Um, the effect was that I felt that unsettledness, but also that I had a little bit of pushback. You know, what do you mean? Do we not care about this? I can install the thing, right? And, and hearing that and saying, yeah, I totally get that. And then repeating that broken record back. Here's why I'm worried, you know? And then the kind of the conclusion of this was awkwardness. Um, we both walked away. I got a text a couple of days later with the plan. Um, it was uncomfortable in the backyards for about a month. Um, and then things kind of went back to normal, just sort of neighborly stuff, because it was a good relationship before, then it was a good relationship after the conflict. And to think about, I don't know what the alternative would have been, but I think that awkwardness of that conflict meant that I later didn't have to look at some in-ground pool that I didn't want to see right next to my house, and that I didn't have to have that just kind of burning ire in me that happens when I don't initiate the conflict. So I hope you can use this tool for yourself, and uh, you know, good luck if you do. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much, Scott, uh, for this wonderful, thoughtful, practical, and methodical presentation, which was a fantastic reminder uh, with new learnings for me personally, and I'm sure our other participants have appreciated it so much as well. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, I feel also very privileged today to introduce to you our second presenter, Jesse Tolan. Jesse is a registered nurse and is currently the manager of emergency department at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. Previously, Jesse has experience as a quality improvement and patient safety leader in both the public and private sectors. She obtained her Master of Science in Nursing, where she focused her studies on the application of high reliability in healthcare with a special interest in nursing situation awareness and decision making. Throughout, she has looked for and loved the opportunities to be a teacher, mentor, and coach. And we're so looking forward to learning from you today, Jesse. Floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm excited to uh, chat with everyone today. So today, with Courageous Conversations, um, we're really going to be looking at exploring the gap. So if we can go to the next slide. So when we hear the word conflict, um, that 
for some of us gives us this like emotional, physical reaction, right? We're getting anxious. Maybe we're getting sweaty. Um, our heart is racing. A lot, majority of people have this unhealthy or this negative association with conflict. And if we go to the next slide, these are some of the words that we kind of come up with, right? When we're thinking about conflict. And even if I was to Google conflict, right? It's something that has to be managed, resolved, mediated, reduced. And so when we're looking at how we're framing this problem, it's pretty much in a not so nice fashion, right? So um, the the challenge that that I have for you today is let's think about reframing conflict. So if we can go to the next slide um is that if we have an it's really an opportunity is an opportunity for creativity for innovation for learning for compassion for diversity of ideas for empathy um think of all the ideas that maybe you didn't bring forward because you were nervous about the reaction or maybe you know some other idea came forward and you actually didn't think it was a good idea right um Think about all the patient safety incidents, right? We know that patient safety harm is one of the number one uh, reasons for injury and harm, right, for uh, our patients. And, you know, some of it could be due to communication. That's a huge piece in the patient safety literature that we talk about. And all these things, you know, are not only conflict within ourselves, but also, um, you know, having conflict with the other or the other person. Maybe it's another organization. Maybe it's, you know, your manager, et cetera. And so in quality, in the quality department, we really talk about what is the problem. And we talk that a problem is really the gap between current and desired state. And we spend most of our time trying to understand how do I know this is a problem? Is this the actual problem? And then let's drill down as to why that problem is happening. And this for me, I had a really hard time, you know, with conflict before uh, and but then when I heard uh, Dr. Nate Ryger on a podcast who uh, wrote the book, um, what is it called now? Who wrote the book Conflict Without Casualties, he just spoke my language. So if we get to the next slide, um, in that the conflict is really the gap between what we want and what we are experiencing. And that it's our really our task to explore this gap by asking the right questions. And then to me, this was like a light bulb moment for me and in terms of uh, how I would move, would move forward, because this is something that I did every day that I love to do. I love to identify problems. I love to problem solve. And it also really helped in framing this conversation that I needed to have with someone in a way that allowed for me to make it about the process and that we together are going to look at this gap together. And it also really helped when just I was beginning in my in my starting out in my leadership journey um, of I just have to be good at asking questions. And that is something that I can practice on the daily with my partner, with uh, my friends, with my colleagues in a safe space that might not seem like to an other person as if you are um, like creating this, I guess, conflict space of, you know, negativity when we're just asking questions. So um, really, this is my, um, this is my strategy to help reframe that conflict and make me feel confident and comfortable so that I don't get sweaty and that I don't get, feel emotional about it, right? So that's really helpful. If we move to the next slide, but then we're really looking at how do we explore this gap together as a team and that's really the importance of asking questions and being you know getting better at asking questions and this is for somebody who's maybe starting out in their conflict journey um, somebody who maybe is having difficulty with conflict really get down to am i asking there are am i asking the right questions so this helps to open communication it creates that authentic interest right it's really about expressing that genuine curiosity and that this is a, a we thing that we need to figure this out together it helps establish trust um, but as well as understand the different perspectives um, and in this way we can actually create value so this is how we can have this conflict and then create this innovation this maybe this new thing that we've never thought of before where we can create it as a learning opportunity um, um, etc. So if we go to the next slide, before we get to that exploration, so I've, you know, we've identified that there's a gap, 
um, that, that needs to be addressed. This also helps me in kind of setting uh, where I am and uh, what is the purpose of us having this conversation is really getting clear on my goal for that conversation and then stating it. And so really in healthcare, what, the way I think about it, I have three jobs. I have to care for my patients. I have to care for my staff members or you have to care for each other, right? The healthcare workers. And then the third thing is we want to improve how we do things. So one and two gets easier. So it's going to be one of these goal statements. So when you're in a pickle and someone comes up to you and they're ready and ra raring to have a conflict with you, I generally have one of these in my back pocket. My goal is for you to feel cared for. My goal is for you to get the best care possible. My goal is for you to be successful. If it's about like performance management, for example, right? So, and then you're able to ground yourself in that that is your goal and that we are going to look at this gap together. Um, I find this very helpful because then we can go back to it as we have our conversation of if things are escalating, please remember my goal is for you to feel cared for. How can we do that together, right? So really getting that at the very beginning of the conversation is super helpful in, in my experience. So if we go to the next slide, these are just some helpful tips and tricks that I have with questions. And really, again, it's just about you being genuinely curious. So when we're setting our goal, when we're stating it's a gap, it's really a lot easier, I find, to then be able to express this curiosity in a way that is non-blaming. That's me versus you, right? It's us against the problem. So having open-ended questions. Of course, you're using your who, what, when, where, and how. My bonus tip is to not use why. And that is because in the literature, and even if we were to think about it together as a group, if someone comes up to you and says, well, why did you do that? There might be an implication of that it's negative, right? That what they did was wrong. Um, and some people also view this as um, basically like you're attacking them. So change your why to how. How did you come to this decision, right? can you explain to me how this happened, right? And so just changing that one word can be so powerful in how we frame that. Of course, using probing and clarifying questions, right? Can you help me understand? Oh, can you explain about that a bit more, right? All those sorts of things. We want to be positively or neutrally biased. So we're not going to come in judgmental, like um, you didn't pick up your sock. Why didn't you pick up your socks? Did you want to make me mad? <laughs> like, we're not just, we're not, um, uh, coming in with kind of those leading questions, those judgmental questions, we want to keep open um, and to understand their perspective. The two other hot tips that I have in terms of asking good questions is the collaborative we. So how do how can we work together to move forward? What is our normal process of uh, how we do this, right? So it's not how do you normally do this, right? It's it's we together as a team. Um, and then the last big tip that I have is ask for help. So I need your help in understanding what happened, right? And so these are kind of the, the key words that I use that kind of help in my own experience, help to make us a team against the, the problem or that gap versus one against the other. I have a few of the phrases in my back pocket that feel good with me. I encourage for you to find your own so that you can test them out. Um, so even if you're at a, for example, if you're sitting at a table at a meeting and a, a physician or maybe your supervisor says something and that you don't agree with, right? You can start with saying, I wonder, or I'm curious about um, uh, how do we know this to be true, right? So really you're asking for like, show me the data, show me the data, right? <laughs> but um, this comes across in a less, um, I guess, uh, combative way. Uh, during the discussion, ensure that you use statements that validate that other person's perspective. Um, and so again, that helps to go back to your goal, um, like I was saying. So again, my goal is for you to be successful or my goal is for you to feel cared for. Um, and remember that it's the gap that you're trying to solve. So uh, for example, coming with a patient or a family who comes to me who maybe wasn't happy with their care um, and they're getting escalated, you can say, so what I'm hearing is, is that, you know, that you uh, were not feeling cared for, right? And so that, and and so you're then going back to what the gap is um, and, or help me understand 
the what is currently happening and what your expectation of happening is, right? And so even just asking those questions and helping to validate their experience, I appreciate and I totally understand that you want your family member cared for. I want my family cared for when they come into the emergency room, right? So um, being able to restate or rephrase um, and really express that understanding around the gap then also allows for us to maybe set expectations later or those sorts of things because it's I've heard you I've heard what you'd have to say so then going to that dear man uh, great framework as well um, and then I would highly encourage that we still take a collaborative approach for questioning for resolving our problems so how would you like to see this happen what does that look like for you um, how can we work together to move forward those sorts of questions um, are super helpful and again making it about a, a team approach and trying to address um, that gap. So if we go to the next uh, slide, I just want people to remember that the conflict will not disappear. And in fact, this is a good thing <laughs> in, in, in our framing of the way that things are happening, uh, because we, are, we want to lead to learning, to innovation, right? So even with patients or with staff members who are having difficulty, and maybe you're, you know, speaking with them um, about maybe some of their own, let's say, behaviors or their own actions. There's a reason why people are doing these things, right? Our, our, and we want to understand why so that we can learn about our system and then create those improvements and create a better experience for people. Um, the struggle will not go away. It's really that the struggle is with the person. And that's really the definition of compassion when we come back to it, right? We struggle with, we don't struggle against. Um, and so that's my challenge for you is to struggle with the, the other, whoever that is. What it does change though, is maybe your confidence because um, maybe it feels less, uh, I don't know, um, like a, a softer approach maybe in terms of asking questions. So when you're a beginner, this is a really great strategy, uh, but it also helps to then have those authentic and productive relationships and actually produce value from this thing that made us sweaty and all those sorts of things at first. So um, if you go to the next slide, some really great books and um, things that have, I guess, helped mold my thinking about dealing with conflict. Um, crucial conversations, if you can take the course, it is fabulous. Um, um, a lot of those ideas about having, you know, asking questions and all those sorts of things are in uh, these steps. From a quality improvement perspective, What's Your Problem is an excellent um, book about reframing and using design thinking methodology of how do we reframe a problem um, to get to something that we didn't even expect. Uh, and then, of course, I talked about Conflict Without ca Casualties, Compassionate Accountability. I think this is an awesome book. It's also lots of um, great podcasts about it if you want the Reader's Digest edition. So uh, check these things out and uh, do what feels right for you. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, we also have a slide up here for other resources from the framework that Scott spoke about, and that's dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, there are uh, there's a whole certification you can get in dialectical behavior therapy, of course. Um, but these are widely available uh, um, uh, uh, manuals. Um, um, so, so please check those those out. Um, the worksheets um, and toolkits are uh, can be really helpful in uh, looking at this topic of having courageous conversations. We're going to uh, slowly flip this over to a Q&A, um, but I will just kind of leave you with additional resources here for mental health services for health and community care workers. Bahar, I think I'm, I'm, I'm taking over your slide. I'm sorry. It's yours, Joe. Is it? it? Is okay. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So, so this is the one I know a lot about. This is the one at St. Joe's, uh, we are a, a regional provider of supports for healthcare workers. That link is still very much active. So please reach out if any of you um, um, need some assistance and want to connect with a peer uh, or perhaps even get connected with more formal mental health resources. Um, and there are other links to other guides around dealing with uh, stress, um, certainly, if you are in any kind of immediate crisis, there is help available. 
uh, there was our provincial resource as well as some physician wellness resources. So a couple of uh, survey questions here before we, uh, we go into a Q&A and have some reflections on the content presented by Scott and by Jesse. Um, uh, Shilpi, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be able to, to handle this particular poll. So question one, if you're able to see that and, uh, and, and choose one of these options, did this session help you gain a better understanding of strategies and tips for supporting yourself during difficult conversation? And it's an agreement scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So if you can just take a moment to uh, endorse one of those. Okay, and then uh, secondly, um, Again, welcome all of your feedback on these uh, events and sessions. Oh, the answers are still coming in, okay. So before we go to the next one, I'll just allow you uh, some time to, uh, to respond to that question. And then secondly, how would you rate the overall quality of today's event? All righty, so the, the, the Q&A is, uh, is open. You can uh, post some questions in there. Um, Shilpi, I don't know if you're able to, um, you know, once we get the survey questions to uh, put our faces back up on the screen. If not, that's okay. Um, so we have, a, we have a question, Joe. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm going to read it. So uh, this is uh, from the um, Hamilton Family Health Team. Thank you for the session in both Jesse and Scott's presentations. There seemed to be an element of planning involved before responding to a conflict. What are some tips on buying time to prepare a response to a conflict? What do you do if there's no time to prepare and you feel you must respond in the moment? That's an excellent question. Uh, Jesse or Scott, uh, which one of you would you like to take this one? I don't mind. That's fine. Go so ahead. this happens, this happens to me often, <laughs> where um, we, we kind of have to act what feels like uh, more immediately. Um, what I would say is, again, um, identifying those questions that you feel confident and comfortable with and really, again, listening and reiterating what the gap is, right? So what I'm hearing is, is that, um, you know, what this individual did is hurt your feelings or what is that you didn't like what they did, et cetera. And so uh, it's just like getting really good at, um, You'll have your one-liners is what is what I like to say. Um, I would also say that if you do have time, it's okay to say, you know, can I give you a call back, right? I do that with patience, right? I'm not able to, I want to be able to give you all the time and attention that this deserves. This is very important to me. Um, is there an opportunity that I can call you back or what have you? So, um, there's no problem in, in slowing it down um, and uh, requesting for that. I don't know if Scott has anything else to add or Joe. No, I, know. I, I like a lot of what you're saying. Uh, maybe one thing just to add to that would be the um, active listening skills are a great way to give yourself that, that breath to think. I think you totally can use Dear Band without planning ahead. It's just better if you do. But um, 
the other side of that spectrum would look like relationship affirming skills. So they're like, okay, I'm hearing you say, mm. just really taking that long, slow, inquisitive thing, which I think is a lot of what Jesse was highlighting that can be so helpful. Yeah, you know, I, I just had uh, one reflection and as a cognitive behavioral therapist, I, you know, I, I kind of look at the word must, you know, and, uh, and, and just, you know, kind of uh, try to be in a position where you feel like you do have options. Like, the, you know, the word must kind of implies that there has to be some kind of response when the reality usually is it doesn't have to be that way. Um, Bakar, any, any, any reactions from, from you on that question? I absolutely agree with all of you. I love the question, love the answers, and many more questions are coming up. So I'm oh, wondering awesome. if we can move on to, to the next one, if you guys don't mind. We also have a participant, Janelle, uh, who would actually uh, would like to speak. So um, Shelby is going to unmute her. Okay. Go ahead, Janelle. You are unmuted, which I don't think you are yet. I think Shelfie is working on that. Uh, Janelle, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go to the next question while we're working on that. Uh, tips for timing of difficult conversations for when you are the person being approached to have a difficult conversation. What are some good statements to set the tone from our, our side? Scott or Jesse? I think I want to be clear about what, sorry, I'm having difficulty in, in understanding the question. So if someone someone comes to you, so you're not the one who's going to have right. that conversation someone is like actually approaching you um how would you what, are there any um advice from you to receive that conversation and Scott, you look like you're ready you've got yeah that. so i think some of the <laughs> some of the similar um framing that jesse was highlighting from last time right the the highlighting the gap the information gathering phase gives you that breath if you're the one being approached you're like i don't i didn't see this coming Right, so you can kind of settle into it. Um, I mean, outside of getting like dear man tattooed on your wrist, like you can, again, you can burn these things into your your memory to where you have a format that you address these things in um, that, that is helpful, right? And, and um, you know, saying, I'm gonna take a breath, I'm gonna come back to it with this template and, and information gathering for a longer period of time really does help when the conflicts kind of feels like it's coming at you. Yeah. And then again, going back to, I think our goals, like I have those goals in my back pocket, right? So being able to say, okay, I, I hear that you're upset and my goal is for you to feel cared for, or my goal is for you to be set up for success. And then can you tell me more about that? Right. So just to slow it down and uh, like, I want to understand your perspective, right? When people are kind of coming at you head on, um, yeah, I think it's just kind of more of the same and practice. The thing is, too, is, is that there's going to be some times where I did not eat my Wheaties today. And, <laughs> and right. And there's learning opportunity in that, too. Right. And 80 um, percent of the time it goes well, the 20 percent of the time, you know, maybe it doesn't. And you learn and you move on. Right. So I think there's that, too. There's there's no perfect, perfect way. Um as well as just these are the strategies that have worked for us and it's taken practice to then feel confident and comfortable and so it's going to take practice for you too in terms of what feels comfortable for you i might just add from kieran's question too thanks for that jesse and scott um would be like there's an acknowledgement there that there is a tone right and i think there's something to say for if you're trying to regulate the emotions in the moment that can that can be really challenging and know that you know you deserve to be able to to, to step aside if if you feel like you're not in a position to be able to engage in so I just wanted to comment on the tone part of that Kieran um very good and so I I don't know Bahar did we get back to Janelle 
Um, so we think that we, we actually unmuted Janelle, uh, but it didn't work. So we asked Janelle if she doesn't mind to type her question in the uh, question and answer with apologies to her for this technical difficulty that we have. Okay, let's let's go to the next questions. Um, Will, these are good tips for direct conflict. How can we handle paraconflict? Where there is ongoing conflict and you are feeling more attacked in a gaslighting way, how do you handle this on a daily basis? Any of you? Yeah, you know, Will, when you when I read that question, I I think I think safety. I don't know, Jesse and uh, and Scott and Bahar, what your what your response is around that. Um, kind of, you know, an acknowledgement of being attacked, a gaslighting way. How do you handle this on a daily basis? I would really uh, encourage encourage you to think of um, a, a safety kind of response um, to, um, uh, to, 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 to start with that uh, as, as a priority. Because, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's not gonna be constructive to kind of engage in these kinds of conflicts and and there's a recognition that it, it could go sideways right so safety number one i don't know what your reactions are to the question that's here god or bahar yeah i think uh there's definitely been a few moments i think in my career where you know you feel like your hands are going up right from mm -hmm. from that conversation and i think once you get that reaction it's now not going to be conducive to to having a discussion. And so what I've done in the past, it, again, I have my my uh, thing that I've written out and now feel comfortable with saying, but um, I'm going to remove myself from this conversation because I don't feel it's going to be productive. Um, and what you're saying is important or what you're you know saying is valid or what, I know I wanna hear what you're saying, however, I want to make sure that we can do that in a respectful manner. And I think that like it's getting, um, we have to feel comfortable with setting that boundary that we are supposed to be professionals. Um, we should be treated with dignity and respect. Um, so removing yourself until we can have that conversation, I'm more than happy to participate, right? And so that that door stays open, it just needs to be done, um, yeah, in a respectful fashion. I think Will is asking a very, very, very good question here. And I think it is important to also acknowledge that um, we don't have to deal with these difficult situations always all by ourselves. Um, reaching out to someone, depending on where the situation is happening, really doesn't matter if it's in our household or if it's in the workplace, wherever this might be happening, uh, we don't have to deal with it by ourselves. At that, at some point, you might need to reach out to someone, uh, maybe with a little bit more uh, knowledge or even power uh, to to uh, play that role of mediation um, or support. Uh, it it sounds like you know the, the use of wording such as attack and gaslighting. Um, as Joe mentioned, um, it would be risky to psychological safety. So um, it is definitely something that might need um, more than just our, our own individual skills to, to be dealing with. I hope, I hope you found that helpful, Will. Um, and I, on the same page there, Bahar, uh, maybe, maybe enlisting a third party to help with that kind of situation. Thank you, Joe. Alrighty. Yeah. Now, um, there's one more question, and I just want to let people know that maybe this will be the last one, because we also want to be respectful and give people a chance to stretch before you go to your next uh, commitment, um, uh, that we're going to be back. Um, and so the next session in April, I think will be more Q&A. Um, um, but uh, let's let's look at this next question about adapting processes for these kinds of conversations when there's a significant power imbalance between parties, for example, with a manager, a patient, or in situations of discrimination? Yeah, great question. Kind of like advanced level, right? Um, and 
And so, um, you know, Scott and, uh, uh, it, it, do you have any reflections to this or Jesse? I know it's, uh, uh, it's, it's probably a big question to kind of put in the form of a soundbite kind of answer, but any particular reflections on that one? I mean, it certainly ups the difficulty level for sure. <laughs> uh, it sounds like the, you're talking about a power imbalance where you're trying to bring, uh, uh, where you're, you're you're trying to verbalize the conflict and you're addressing it to someone who is carrying more power. I do think that that can fit into the described situation. I mean, it depends on your level of trust and how much engagement there is with the person who is the authority figure who you're addressing, if I am understanding the question correctly. But, um, you, you, you know, naming that, in the describe, here's the action that I'm seeing, here's the nature of our relationship, and in the expression, you know, this is the way that I'm perceiving, or, or the, the, this is the, what my worries or my thoughts relative to this power imbalance. Um, I think what I really like about Dear Man is it's, it's an effort to move some of these more passive, implicit parts of the conversations into direct speech, which, you know, is not the end of addressing a power imbalance, but it certainly goes a long way, just like with conflict of interest, right? We want to identify the conflict of interest, not necessarily just uh, just ignore it and act like it's going to go away because we do. Yeah, I think that yeah, I think it's hard. Um, it's definitely harder. Um, if we're trying to speak to somebody, for example, above me, right? Um, to be honest, I, I feel like a broken record, but it's still using those those questions and until I understand maybe how our relationship is, right? How open and honest can I be? How, um, so um, it helps me to kind of feel it out, tiptoe around <laughs> when I have um, some of those, some of those questions, um, if I'm feeling uncomfortable. And uh, again, I think with patients and with people who are and managers, like what's our mutual purpose? So what is that mutual thing that we're we're trying to do? Or, for example, maybe a manager is asking for me to do something that I'm uncomfortable with, right? Going back to that mutual purpose, and um, I'm un uh, using the dear man, right? Being able to say why we're uncomfortable, being clear on a, like uh, uh, the context and the intent of you coming forward. Um, can be really important. Um, so, and like how that impacts you as an individual, right? So, um, and keeping it about you versus um, them as well, right? When we say, well, you did this, or you're asking me to do something instead, I don't feel, I feel like my license is put on the line, or I don't feel like I have enough knowledge, skill, and judgment in order to do this. Is there an opportunity for training? Being able to come forward, particularly uh, to maybe your management with solutions as well, um, is that you've already talked about, like thought about this, right? Um, those sorts of things is, is can also be a strategy. Thanks, Jesse. Well, I, I think we're gonna we're gonna bring today's uh, session to a close. Um, I. Um, you know, I think we're 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 going to have a, an excellent. I mean, I think it sets the foundation for an excellent second uh, session in April. Um, and um, you know, we will look at these questions again, and then and, and we'll do some homework on our end in terms of presenting more uh, practical tools and tips. We heard that loud and clear from people when we asked for some feedback. Uh, and this topic, courageous conversations is so relevant these days. We, we, we know our, our, our resources and our capital is stretched um, and uh, we, we see conflicts brewing in us and our clients, our patients, uh, our employees, uh, and also between each other. So um, thank you, Jesse and Scott, um, for um, some practical tips and you know, kind of acknowledging there's a number of these systems out there, but I think you've really um, the sample is a really good tool for us to kind of practice between now and April. Um, uh, so those are my reflections at the end of today's sessions. Thank you again, Bahar. Absolutely enjoyed the session, learned a lot from um, all three of you, including yourself, Joe, always um, so much to teach us yourself. Uh, and um, and the, absolutely the acknowledgement that we have gone through three years of 
really global pressure on all of us. So it is it is okay to feel not okay sometimes and um, not being able to deal with conflicts the way that would uh, be titled as perfect. And it is okay as long as we're constantly working on gaining some new skills, uh, which were we were given by uh, both of you, Scott and Jesse, today. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, a resource list and a link to the ev evaluation will be sent out uh, by email within um, the, the next 24 hours to all of you, our uh, wonderful participants. Uh, the evaluation link can also be found in the chat. Um, Shelby will um, put that in the chat for you all. Uh, we, we appreciate you participating in these series. We hope that you enjoy them and we really do hope that we see you again. Bye, Thank everyone. you. Have a wonderful rest of the day.